Thanks. Okay, so so this is uh, we'll try to finish this up very quickly. Um, here's my my collaborators. Anything that's wrong, blame me. Um, ITGC is you know I just been sitting here with this big grin on at all the science, uh, but that's a big problem because we actually do know this now that that what you have done is to identify a whole lot of things that are going on that affect ice sheet stability that cannot yet be well included in models. And that means the models really cannot assess the risk of, of ice sheet instability driving rapid sea level rise. And as we discussed this morning, the community is full of heroes who are, who are doing way more than they can do with the resources they have. We can't just browbeat people. We have a huge challenge to get more resources, and this has to be our community communication going forward. So that's my conclusions. So you know the story. This is West Antarctica. There's Thwaites. It sits in the West Antarctic Rift System. The ice wants to follow the structures, but it's forever to get out to the ice front. And that means the ice is piled up in the middle. And because it's piled up, it leaks out the side. And all Thwaites is, is the leakage across structure of ice. It doesn't want to go that. And here's a picture of Thwaites if you could add a couple of more levels converging vertically. Because Thwaites is this huge bottleneck of convergence horizontally and vertically. It's stuck in the mouth of this bottleneck. This is something from, from Dave Pollard. Over here is sort of the modern grounding line. Light colors mean very shallow. It's not very long. It's not very deep. It can't dump much ice. If you back up a little down here, it gets way deeper, a few times deeper. It gets way wider. You can get an order of magnitude or two more discharge without speeding up, just by backing up like this, but then it will speed up. So we have to get the retreat from the sill or the lack of retreat from the sill right. And we really do have to get it right. now. This is a paper Byron wrote 10 years ago. It's 10 years. And this is not the only one that has done this, but I'm just going to use this one. Byron was not projecting the future of the ice sheet. He was saying, what matters? When I go in the model and tweak all the knobs, what are the knobs we're going to have to nail if we're going to get this retreat or not on the sill correct? Okay. And he's walked through things, and I'm going to walk through it here. Existing topographic variability, resolving the bumps might actually make it more stable. Resolving the troughs makes it less stable. If you missed Rosie's poster yesterday, you should go back and look. We need to resolve the topography. That's not easy at the scale that matters. Okay. Coupling ice-ocean interactions, hugely important. The the Progress on this is blow you away amazing from Melton Tarzan, but putting all of that into our models, especially for the Western side, is not going to be easy. This is a real big challenge. I want to highlight one piece of this, and I want to highlight these two papers. They're not the only ones, but Shuji's work and, and Karen's work. Ice shelves don't just thin and thin and thin. They thin to some threshold and they break off. And we're learning how to recognize when they're going to break off, but that's a real challenge to put into. Now, if they break off, that raises this next one, which is the full momentum solvers. Because if you get a cliff like this one in Helheim, the stresses at it are not the stresses in the interior of an ice shelf. There's a different one, different additional ones. Those drive faster thinning. We're worried about getting the retreat right. The retreat or non-retreat or advance is a small difference between really big quantities. And you have to do that right. Getting the thinning right, getting the lubrication right, right in that zone at the grounding zone is going to be really challenging. And Sierra Melton's work on this is important going forward. OK, then this is one that's getting a lot of attention now. We had a breakout zone of marine influence, right? Byron put in his model. If he gave Thwaites a grounding zone, it was hard to destabilize it. If he or if he gave it a grounding line, if he gave it a grounding zone and let the ocean work a little farther in, it was easy to destabilize it. 
10 years ago, grounding zone is the key here. It increases the, the melt in the cavity by letting the water get closer in and going underneath. If you missed Eric Rigno's talk, it was brilliant. There's a grounding zone at Thwaites. If you haven't seen Kaya Riverman's data, it's brilliant. There's a grounding zone at Thwaites. Our physical understanding, our data from other ice shelves. These are ones just from sort of our group. The, the, there are estuaries under ice shelves. There, there's more than this going on around here. And it's pretty straightforward. A grounding zone extending inland favors instability. A grounding line favors stability. The data show that Thwaites has a grounding zone favoring instability. The models almost entirely have a grounding line favoring stability. And if you've got a line and you're not somehow parameterizing it against paleo data, you're not capturing the risk. And then we come back here, basal rheology. This is a fascinating study. This is at all the, the ABUMIP, wonderful piece of work. These are IPCC class models, slightly old now. But in this particular experiment, they took all of Antarctica. They gave it a completely irrational forcing. Instantly, the ice shelves start melting rapidly and they continue melting rapidly. And across all of these models, now there's no grounding zones here. None of these models triggered cliff collapse. So there's none of that going on. But you just instantly warm the, the ocean around these models and ask what happens to, their, to them and sea level. And one of the models actually started growing Antarctica, lowering sea level a little. One of the models dumped almost seven meters of sea level in 100 years. And you can see in between. So warm the, the existing models that had underpinned the IPCC somewhere between slight growth and seven meters of sea level rise. <laughs> Most of the difference in that comes from the sliding law, the bed. Is it viscous? Is it plastic? But we actually know a lot about that now, and it's mosaic. So these are some of the people who have figured out what the bed looks like and what it's made of. And this is a piece of the bed of Thwaites. This is 5K here. The dark blue to the light is 600 meters vertically. This is the ice flowing over the structures of the West Antarctic Rift. And the dots are the seismics. This says rock, this says till. Okay, so the bed where it's facing the ice is, is eroded in rock, where it's in the lee, it's tell. And the bed is not plastic, it's not viscous, it's rock viscous till plastic, rock viscous till plastic, it's mosaic. Right? Now, Stephen Colner worked with Byron back when Stephen was an undergrad. He did the simplified what matters modeling. And he found sometimes the mixed bed is nicely between the end members, and sometimes it's more extreme than either one. Okay. So Emily Schwanz is putting this into ISSM with help from Mathieu, and thank you. And, um, you know, so I'm going to show you a simulation. It doesn't have a grounding zone. It doesn't have clip collapse, but what we're, and I'm going to show you the, the basal shear stress, but what you will see is the mixed bed in the middle retreats faster than either the viscous bed or the plastic bed. We've got this whole range of others, but you see who dies first, it's the mixed bed in the middle. Okay. Now, whether that's a linear viscous or as a squared or a cube, there's a lot of work to do. These are a few of the folks within ITGC who are working on the question of how exactly to dial that. Um, and then there's this one other one that comes from Doug McHale. The ice flow against those giant bumps is making big pressure fluctuations that's going to drive the lubricating water in weird places. And we're really not doing that at this point. Okay. So really, what are we now? We're back to where the IPCC was in the fourth assessment. We don't have these processes in the models. We can't put them in yet. And so the state of understanding really does present a best, prevent a best estimate of sea level rise. The IPCC, if you remember, in the fourth said, well, we'll tell you how much sea level will rise, except for whatever the ice sheet does that we don't know. <laughs> and that's really where we are again, right? 
And fixing this is huge. It is not easy. This is not well parameterized. The, those grounding zones are not ready to drop into a model. You can't plug them in easily. We're going to need field work. We're going to need remote sensing. We're going to need lab. We're going to need theory. And we're talking about big changes. Instrumental data have not seen a big change. And if we see a big change, we're screwed and we failed. We're going to have to calibrate against paleo. Getting an ice sheet, getting it to the shelf edge, getting it back to today, getting rid of it in the Pliocene, okay? and matching the recent stuff. This is huge. And I'll tell you, current ITGZ funding is not even close. It just isn't. So, so you know, I celebrate what you're doing. I celebrate the process. It's spectacular. It's wonderful. But what this group has done is to make the unknown unknowns known. And you've increased our understanding of the uncertainties. The real fun ought to be now, but we're going to need real money. And please. I started working with Ian Willens 46 years ago on things like this. I've been at this for a really long time. I want to live long enough to see it happen. I really want to live long enough to understand what's going to happen. And so we have to get the word out. We can solve this, but we need a lot more support.